What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 280. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources, and joining me on the line, just like every week, it's Luis Scott Vargas. What's up, LSV? Oh, not a whole lot. I'm uh, back and beginning to recover from the Pro Tour. Yeah, I'm the same, man. This jet lag, it'll get you. I, I keep waking up at you know, five in the morning. And, and by the time like 11 o'clock at night rolls, rolls around when I'm usually, you know, into my second draft of the evening, I start nodding off. <laughs> it's like, it always takes me a while to recover. Um, we'll be talking about the pro tour, by the way, and your, your preparations for it and stuff, uh, as part of our main topic for the show. Uh, before we do though, got a bunch of cool stuff to, uh, to announce a couple of little changes for the show and, and some exciting stuff. Um, uh- I'm still going to be the co-host, right? You are. We're still doing the show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and by we, I mean you and I. <laughs> uh, so first things first, channelfireball.com. They are the sponsors of Limited Resources. We are proud to have them as our sponsor. Uh, and a whole lot of cool stuff going on over there right now. Um, the first one that I wanted to mention because it's specific to the show is that – the limited resource T-shirts are available over on Channel Fireball now. Really exciting! I've I've actually been working on getting these things done uh, since. Well, it's been like nine months, uh, and and I could probably have gotten it done sooner, <laughs> but uh, but it turns out when you're when you're doing it for the first time, uh, there's a whole lot of like sampling and process and stuff that needs to go on to get T-shirts made. But they are finished, and they are in fact in the hands of CFB. And uh, you can go on to channelfireball.com and order them now. Um, one of the things I did with that is I thought it would be – well, look, our listeners are all about value. We know that. And so um, one of the things that I wanted to do to kind of just up the value a little bit was put in a couple little add-ons uh, to the T-shirt. So I had a bunch of limited resources pins made. Uh, they're small. They're like the little ones that you put maybe on your bag or you know whatever. And, uh, and also a sticker. So if you order the T-shirt, you're going to get um, the sticker – and the pin included in your order as well. So that's pretty cool. They are $11.99 as well. We wanted to make sure, you know, that as many people could get them as as possible. So I'll put a link in the show notes to that as well. It's also on lrcast.com. But I'm excited that those are there. People have been asking for those for quite a while. Um, and uh, yeah, they've got the the they're black. They got the LR logo on the front and the back and in the inside tag. I had a little custom thing designed so that uh, there's no tag there, so there's no scratchy you know little tag. It's just printed on the inside, and there's some fun little stuff in there too. Um, also going on with Channel Fireball. Grand Prix Vegas. You can find out all the details at GrandPrixVegas.com, but pretty cool uh, little threshold here, LSV. Yeah. uh, As of a couple hours ago, we actually hit 4,501 people signed up, which officially makes this the biggest Magic Tournament in history. And this is is a month out. We're we're a month and a week away from the tournament, and it's already the biggest tournament in history. So insane. Yeah. And that's great. I mean – Look, this thing could get up to six, seven, maybe even higher, you know, a thousand people. And, uh, I mean, I'm certainly going to be there. I know you are. It's going to be, I, I, I'm looking forward to it as potentially like the highlight of the year for magic. Um, the, the last GP Vegas is something I'll never forget. It was fantastic. Uh, and it was just so insane to, I walked up on the judge stage, which was in the middle, um, looking out over the effectively four GPs worth of <laughs> attendance out there. And uh, it was insane. <clears throat> there was also a photographer on site, Craig Gibson. He's a pro tour photographer. And, you know, he had to go way up in the rafters to take pictures just to get everything in, in his camera lenses view. There were so many. And this one has already exceeded that. And it, it's just going to keep going up. So again, Grand, Grand Prix Vegas.com. Uh, that's where you want to go. Also, there's some cool like registration award rewards going on, Luis. What's going on with that? So basically, every time you hit another hundred people registered, so you know, 4,500, 4,600, 4,700, etc., we give away another awesome card. Uh, the next one up is Foil Dark Confidant. Oh yeah, and you know, it gets scales up from there, giving away revised dual lands, uh, eventually pieces of power. If we hit the whole full ten thousand, Black Lotus goes up for grabs. <laughs> oh wow. But uh, if you're one of the people registered, then you're entered into the raffle. So the earlier you register, the more different rewards you're going to be eligible to try and win. Uh, though I, I, that unfortunately I don't believe applies to me. So <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> that's cool though. Um, so so that's awesome. Uh, and make make sure you check that stuff out and, and maybe even get a cool prize. Yeah, um, if you're if you're going to go to the Grand Prix, the sooner you register, the better. There's no there's no sense in waiting. Yeah, and you know once I saw that there's 
uh, registration for the side events, I'm like, oh man, this is a real deal. <laughs> you know, like yeah, there, some of the side events are going to fill up. You should take a look at the side events you want to play it and and see if they look like one of those side events that's going to fill and just register for it. Yeah, you really should. And there's a lot of good value to be had there for sure. I know there was last time too. Um, so yeah, so check out everything there at channelfireball.com. Of course, you'll get uh, all the singles, sealed product, and awesome free content that you can handle over at CFB. Um, Next on the list, the Patreon. So uh, this is, you know, a way for you uh, to support the show directly. If you'd like, if if you found value in the podcast, you can sign up. And basically the way it works, it's real simple, is you pick how much you want to give. And when a new show goes up, it takes that much. It can be 50 cents a show. It can be five bucks a show. It's whatever you want, whatever you're comfortable with. And it's super easy to set up. One one of the things, though, that had occurred to me lately is I've been trying to work on ideas on getting the – uh the patrons, as they're called, uh, more involved, you know, and, and getting them even more value. I'm always my, – my brain's always working on how to maximize that kind of thing. And uh, the first thing we did was last week with BDM, we started doing the the Patreon question of the week. So um, I've got one of those here that we'll be talking about in just a moment. But before we do, I've got another really cool little thing that I've decided to do. I've decided to do a monthly giveaway uh, for patrons. So uh, we'll be announcing once per month. Um, one of the one of the patrons is going to win a, an, an LR gift pack, and and currently I, I kind of keep changing it around a little bit, but the one that's going out for this is going to have uh, a limited resources sticker, a pin like the button thing that I talked about earlier, uh, the T-shirt, uh, two packages of sleeves, and then one other cool thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to start keeping the rares from our cracker packs, and the winner of each month is going to get the the rares from the previous cracker packs as well. So. That's just a, a bit of extra value for you, and uh, and I'm I'm not gonna I'm announcing it here, so I'm taking a minute to talk about it. But in the future, it won't be something that we're gonna you know spend a whole lot of like physical actual time on. But we do you know, but we do want to say thank you, and this is just kind of another way to do it. So I've got the winner of the first one, and it was actually kind of funny, Luis. Uh, it, so is it is it me? It is, it is not you. You're also not eligible for this particular <laughs> prize, um, but. So I I put it into a randomizer and then, you know, have it spit out a name for me. And the name it spit out was Cardboard Crack. And I'm like, wait a minute. Did I do this wrong? (laughs) Now, Cardboard Crack, for those of you that don't know, is a really fun and cool webcomic that is about magic. It's a stick figure comic, uh, if you've ever seen those. And it's it's exclusively about magic. And it is – I love it. Uh, Look, it's not like one of those things that like goes super deep and, you know, whatever. But like you check it out. Um, the person who makes it puts out a ton of these things. I've got all the books. I've got, I've got them sitting right next to me. I, I love the books. And, uh, and I just think that cardboard crack is fun and light and cool. And, and I think it's really funny as well. Anyway, it turns out the person who makes cardboard crack also is a patron. <laughs> and so that's why the name got spat out to me here. It wasn't that I copy pasted some, you know, web link or whatever in there. In fact, it was just, uh, that was the name. So cardboard crack, congratulations. You are our first winner. Uh, uh, what I need though, is I need an email to LR at LR cast from you that says your t-shirt size so that I can send this thing off to you and I'll make sure to, uh, to get that address done as well. So congratulations to cardboard crack, our first winner, of the uh, Patreon giveaway. All right, let's get into the show here. Um, the first thing I want to do is the Patreon question of the week. And this one goes kind of deep, Luis, but I thought it was a good one. It was also one, the thing is like, we're getting a lot of really good questions in there and uh, it's, it's tough to pick, but I'm really happy that, that we have so many great choices. I chose this one because a lot of people in there uh, kind of, you know, upvoted and, and actually just said, I want to, I want to know the answer to that question. And so that's why I picked it. I think that might be a good way to kind of help narrow down which ones we actually want to read. Um, this is from Jason McMullen, who says, um, he says, can you discuss cheating in competitive play? He says, I'm a long time casual. And for the last year or so, I've been trying to seriously improve my limited and constructed games. I'm attending my first GP in a couple of months. One of the areas I struggle with is keeping track of my opponent to catch illegal plays. He says, I think I should be watching my opponents very closely between all the sloppy players and the fact that there are actual cheaters running around. How do you handle these things? How much time, uh, spent, how, how much time spent tracking your opponent's play is too much time. So thanks for the question, Jason. 
And, uh, you know, Luis, you've got way more high level tournament experience than I do. So I want to throw this one to you. How, how do you, how do you manage this? So the, I guess the first thing that, uh, my first line of defense is really just playing my normal game because honestly, when you're playing a normal game, you should kind of just be keeping track of your opponent's cards in hand. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, you don't, ha- I don't ask every single turn, but I, ha- I usually have a good sense. I mean, I've been playing a long time. Sometimes I can just, you know, walk into a game in progress and tell someone mulligan just because they're down a card, even without really counting. Mm-hmm. But so you should be paying attention to that. I don't go super deep like this uh, in the question. Actually, some of the notes here, it looks like the the person who submitted it says they, they track both life totals on paper and consider tracking the land drops and card draw effects. Mm-hmm. Do not do this. Do not start tracking extraneous information. I, I think the people who like write down what does the damage and stuff like that, I think that is actually, you're cutting into your actual play skill at that point because there's so many things going on in a game of magic that you should not be spending memory and thought on things that don't actually matter. And you can backtrack enough. I think without taking like detailed notes, if you're taking detailed notes, you're, you're just, you're just missing something. So, okay, so you're you're not a big advocate for for overdoing that part of it, at least. No, certainly not. What I think is going to help you get more comfortable in in making sure you're not getting cheated is, first of all, communicate clearly with your opponent. A lot of uh, kind of discrepancies, whether it's cheating or just misunderstandings, happen when both players don't aren't on the same page. When your opponent thinks a trigger is already resolved and you don't, or when your opponent thinks, you know that uh, blocks have already been declared, but you're actually thinking before declaring final blocks, like that sort of thing. So the clearer you can make sure everything is going on, the better it's going to be for both players, honestly. And I mean, again, this bridges the gap from cheating to just making sure the game is progressing uh, correctly. But a lot of, uh, a lot of the kind of bad situations happen when you attack and your opponent puts things into, you know, creatures in front of theirs, but they're still thinking. And then you play a giant growth and it's like, well, I wasn't done blocking, and then you start arguing. So make sure things are happening clearly. Communicate with your opponent. And just pay attention to what's going on in the game. I Honestly, I've been playing the game a long time. I've you know, been playing Pro Tours over 10 years. I don't feel like my opponents have tried to cheat against me very often at all. It's just, it's not, I mean, it's certainly present. You do have to watch for it, but it's not an endemic thing. It's not like, yeah, one out of three of my opponents cheat me. I think it's like by less than 1% of my opponents have tried to, to get away with stuff. I mean, it has happened a few times, but I've played thousands of matches. So I think you should just concentrate on playing your game. And, you know, when something fishy goes on, maybe you'll be able to tell. But I wouldn't go out of my way to do it, and I wouldn't worry about it so much. I think focusing on getting better, practicing, knowing your deck, knowing the format, and, you know, in case of limited, and just playing the best game you can will go the longest way because you'll naturally kind of pick up on a lot of what – what could be going on that it, that is incorrect. Yeah. And yeah, I think if you worry over much about cheating, you're actually just going to cut into your win percentage, especially when your opponent's not cheating because most of your opponents won't be cheating. And I don't th- and just because there were a couple high profile disqualifications doesn't mean I th- sends I mean, it just pisses me off so much because <laughs> not only are these people stealing from their opponents when they do cheat, they also make people, you know, like this this listener think, man, there's a lot of cheating that goes on. Look at all these people that got disqualified. It's like, no, there, there really isn't. But it's so loud when it happens. So yeah. it, it's really so hugely negative for Magic. So if anyone listening is thinking about cheating, please just stop playing Magic. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously, though, I, I agree with, with, with what you're saying, Luis, that uh, it's not as big of a problem as people think. My, my advice uh, – to supplement what you said, I, I agree with everything you said, uh, is um, don't be afraid to call the judge, right? I think that that's one that has been – I think that drum has been beaten sufficiently. Uh, you know, I think people generally know if they're going to play in a high-level event that it's okay to call the judge. Um, the the thing that I would encourage you to do though is to be pretty diligent about it. Um, you know, the the thing I think people think of when, when they think of cheating is – stacking the deck, hiding cards, right? These sort of blatant cheating. Um, But the kind of cheating that I would actually be more worried about, um, you know, just from a bigger picture perspective are the little things, right? The the things that it's very easy to explain away, uh, like, oh, I just didn't think I played a land, I'll pick it up, sorry. You know, or like, you know, they tap all their mana, play a spell, and you're like, hey, wait, you don't have, you know, double white for that card. And they're like, oh, sorry, yeah, I forgot. So th- those little things, um, you know, if if you let a judge know my opponent just tapped his mana and 
and didn't have double white for the spell, they'll give them a warning. And a warning's no big deal. Like you, you can withstand, you know, multiple warnings before you start seeing actual punishment. So if it was really just a mistake, then it's no, it's nothing. Um, but if it is something that, that this person's trying to do to multiple opponents, then you calling the judge can help, help establish a track record for that. And the judges will see a pattern at some point. But if nobody ever does that and just sort of laughs it off like, oh, yeah, I've done that before, too, then that then that can you know not happen. So I, I do advocate for being diligent about um, things like that that look really small, but that are actually like, you know, we, we call that angle shooting in, in poker. It's it's. It's not that, you know, a rule is being explicitly blatantly broken. It's just like going into the gray area where there's some advantage. Um, yeah, and then, I would call them uh, cheats of opportunities. The other, yeah, it, that's it, a good way to put it. Yeah. When it, when it crosses the line to cheating, it, it is cheating. It's a cheat of opportunity. Angle shooting is slightly on the other side of the line. And either way, it's not great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're right. That's true. Uh, angle shooting usually implies that you're not actually breaking a rule and uh and and what i described was so you're right it's a cheat of opportunity um the other thing that i would say just from advice perspective is that uh i agree with luis it's it's actually very rare that somebody's out to get you like that it it, it's magic is a relatively clean game the judges have done a great job and uh and it's not something you need to worry about matching and match out that said i would trust my gut um if if something just kind of feels weird about what's going on with my opponent and how they're playing, uh, th- my I usually get sort of a you know spidey sense thing going where I'm just like something's just a little different here than than a normal game of magic, and then I'll just pay a little bit closer attention then, and that way I'm not just one of these people that sits down and constantly is on the defensive and looking for things you know like oh you're cheating and doing it. It's just like I do need to see a little something first and then. And then, and then I will, you know, pay a little bit more attention to what my opponent's up to specifically. Um, and I think that the, the advice is to go ahead and follow your gut on that, you know, just sort of keep your, your feelers out there. And, and if something comes back, then go for it, but otherwise just concentrate on playing the best magic you can. Um, all right. So thanks again to, uh, Jason for the question. Um, and for everybody who submitted one, I'll, I'll be putting up another, uh, I'll probably just put it up after I put up this show. Uh, and, and there'll be another thread on the Patreon that you can join if you're a patron. It's for patrons only, and you can uh, submit your questions there. Can I okay. submit a question? What's that? Can I submit a question? You, no, you cannot. You're not <laughs> eligible. You want to crack all, a pack? All, all we're doing is things I'm not eligible for tonight. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> but you are eligible for crack a pack. Uh, you are not eligible to smell this beautiful booster that I just opened. Oh, God, that's good. Um, but you are eligible to, uh, to help me pick what card we're going to take out of it. No, yeah, I'll allow it. It is, all right, first one, Colagon Aspirant. Colagon Aspirant is like a lot of the two drops in the set. You'll, you'll play them, they'll fill out your curve, but you really don't want to be taking them early. Yeah, that's the, the two one for one in a red, and, uh, if it gets blocked, it pings the blocker. Um, yeah. Dromica Dune Casters next, that's that one drop O2 in white. And uh, it's the tapper. One in a white tap it to tap a creature without flying. Uh, card hasn't really held up, has it? Well, I mean, when I first saw the card, I thought it was bad. And then, then I played oh, okay. with the card, and I think it's still bad. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. See, when I first saw it, I, I thought it was decent. And now I think it's bad. Yeah. I, I think that the card is is more of a sideboard card against uh, against a deck with like a bunch of green ground pounders than mm-hmm. it is a card I'd ever want in my main deck. Yeah, I think that's exactly where it landed for me as well. I've brought it in against green red decks and been felt like it's held its own. I, I still honestly have never been blown away by the card. I've never been like, wow, you know, this is the place. It's not exactly a silver bullet. It just brings it up to playability. Uh, Dutiful Attendant is next. That's the uh, three drop in black. And when it dies, you get to uh, get a creature back from your yard. It's a one, two. I like Dutiful Attendant as a, as a role player in the like exploit decks, but uh, this is it's one of the weaker ones and not one I want to take early. Yeah, I'm I'm on board for that. Um, Pinion Feast sideboard card. That's the uh, four and a green instant to destroy a creature with flying and bolster two. You still have this in the sideboard camp, right? I do. I think in in sealed you're gonna main deck it a little more often and. Yeah, if you're running short on playables, you could main deck it because it is a powerful effect. But it yeah, sure it is, is. It is not. It is not a card to use. You probably do want in your main deck. No. Um, Mystic Meditation is next. That's the three and a blue sorcery. Draw three, and then discard two cards unless you discard well the most important creature card type of card for limited creature. <laughs> 
And as much as I like card draw, this actually is a card that I tend to not play. I've Me too. Played it, I've played it once or twice if you're really, really short of of spells and you need it for like a prowess deck of some kind. But in general, this is just not a good card. The rate is just not good. It's just not good enough. Yeah. And, and you know, you've got the uncommon – what's it called? Sight Beyond Sight? Sight Beyond Sight is much better. Yeah. The, like that's, that's a real one. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, next is a good one. It's Tail Slash. So that's the uh, two and a red instant and it's like Fall of the Hammer. It, Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to a creature you don't control. Yeah, from talking, well, first certainly within our team, and then talking with uh, Ben Stark about about how, kind of where they valued, uh, his, you know, Ben's on Team Ultra Pro th- this time, mm-hmm. where they where they valued this. Just about everyone uh, put this somewhere in the top three red commons. Red has three common removal spells. This is one of them, usually near the bottom, usually like third, but it is it is definitely a fine card. It's often going to do three to four damage. The, the biggest downside is that you kind of put yourself vulnerable to a, an opposing removal spell and targeting your creature, but it's still just a pretty clean kill most of the time. Yeah, and you know we've talked about that before on the show as well. How the uh, how how the opposing removal isn't really up to snuff uh, in a lot of ways these days, and you can get away with cards like this a lot easier. What are the other two? Twin Bolt and Sarkon's Rage. Is yeah, that, those are the other. So I. I, I, I mean, Twin Bolt is more often first. Most people like that one more the most, but uh, I could see some combination of, of of those three cards being near the top. And the, all three of them are fine cards to take early. If I mean, you're not obviously you're not happy if you first pick a common just at all because uh, that's mm-hmm. just not how sets work these days. But if you're gonna first pick a common, picking any of those commons is fine. Yeah, it seems fine. Obviously not up to snuff with roast at, at uncommon, but um, defeat. Is next. That's one in a black sorcery to start a creature with power two or less. I did another decent filler card. It's good in your opening hand because on turn two, it's going to kill anything they can play. And, you know, every now and then it hits a higher value target like an Akud Cobra or something along those lines. Uh, but in general, uh, I kind of want like zero to one of these in my deck and I'm not super sad if I don't get any. Yeah, that's where I ended up landing on it too. You know, in the right situation, it ends up looking pretty decent. Like you said, if you find a high value card like a four drop or something that it can kill or even if it's just a matter of you know sniping their morph on on, after they cast it but uh, the problem is that you know defeat starts to look a little worse later in the game when when those cards have already been flipped up or whatever or maybe they're just not the cards that you actually want to kill and uh and it doesn't really do you any favors either uh sorcery speed means that you don't really get the blowout and uh yeah it kind of just has all ticked down defeat for me uh glint is next. It's one in a blue instant and a creature, your target creature gets plus O plus three and hex proof. This is not, not, not the kind of combat trick I want to main deck because it doesn't increase the power of your creature. And at costing two, I guess it's a sideboard card, but I've only sided it in like once. It was, it was good the one time I sided it in though. I what was it, it against in, like red or? <clears throat> I sided it in against, yeah, a, a, a red black deck that had a couple different removal spells, including spells like Reach of Shadows, which are a little more expensive in Sarkin's Rage. Mm. So you can, once you get a mana advantage out of doing that, and I had some particularly good creatures. So Okay. But in general, this is not a card you're going to play or take early. Now, you said that wasn't the t- type of combat trick you liked. What about Artful Maneuver? Uh, that's the one in a white instant plus two creature gets plus two plus two, and it's got rebound. I like this one a little more, but I'm still not really excited to take it in the first couple picks. It's... Artful Maneuver is a fine card. It's going to win a combat and then deal two to maybe a little more extra damage if it pushes your attacker past blockers. But in general, <clears throat> I don't put a high priority on combat tricks at all in this set. And Glint just is one of the ones I don't want to play, whereas Artful Maneuver I'll play, but I won't take early. Yeah, you don't want to take it this early. Revealing Wind. No, that's the fog. I'm just yeah. out on that one. Ooh, it's uncommon time, though, and we already got a good one. One of my favorites, in fact, Ukud Cobra. You mentioned it a minute ago when we were talking about defeat, but uh, this is, of course, the 2 5 death touch for four mana. I like this guy. Yeah, Cobra was pretty hard in a draft pick order. Uh, it's probably the third best black uncommon, but still, black has all insane uncommons. So, uh, oh, that's yeah. It's not, not, not saying a whole lot. And I would be pretty happy to first pick an Akud Cobra. That's above an, uh, an above average first pick. Yeah, and it's better than Tail Slash, right? Yeah, I think by, by a pretty good margin. It's I think just. so too. There's some games you're going to play this and your opponents can never attack you on the ground. Yeah. It, hit, it hits for two, so if you're gearing up to attack, it does relevant damage. And, you know, defeat aside, there's not a whole lot that can kill it very easily. Yeah, you know, one of the cool things uh, when you are attacking with it is that often 
a two five would get double blocked, right? Like that's kind of the problem with two five in in any type of low toughness or excuse me, high toughness, low power creature is that they just put two or three creatures in front and it trades for either zero or one of them. But Death Touch, of course, changes that and whatever two creatures they put in front are dying, and, and that's pretty amazing. Um Stormwing Dragon is next. Uh this is the red version of that one cycle, you know, for the for the dragons. It's a Six mana, three, three, flying first strike, but it's got Megamorph for seven. And of course, uh, it, it randomly puts counters on your other dragons when you flip it up. But it ends up being a four, four first strike if you Megamorph it. Yeah, this whole cycle has been either filler or to slightly above filler. Yeah, it's underwhelming. I, I mean, the 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 low water mark is still pretty decent just because it's a, they're all morphs. But hmm. o- o- only like the blue and the white ones are ones that I'm, you know slightly happy to have in my deck the rest i'll certainly play but i'm not you know gonna go out of my way for yeah it's just too expensive to unmorph yeah that's it the seven mana really kind of broke those and and you're certainly not getting a good rate paying six mana for a three three flying first strike that's it's not embarrassing but it's not up to snuff either um our last uncommon in case in ice so this is one of those you know situational cards that they printed a, a run of it's one in a blue Flash for an aura, and you can enchant a red or green creature. When this thing enters the battlefield, you tap that creature, and that creature doesn't untap as long as this thing's on it. So it's really nice. Uh, I think this card's excellent. Um, but, you know, you need to be playing a good deck that's at least playing red or green. Uh, ideally, they'd be playing both, of course. But either one, you know, that has some decent targets, and you're going to bring in your encase and ice. But you're not you're not taking a sideboard card this high, right? No, certainly not. I mean, it's nice having this just in case, but it's still not a card I'm going to take very early because you can't really take it over good playables. You can take it over mediocre playables, but the first couple picks are ideally taking good cards. So, our rare. It's time to ring the bell. <laughs> we got a Zergo in we the got house. got a Zergo, yeah. So, red for a 2-2 legendary orc warrior. He can't block creatures with power 2 or greater, and he's got dash for 1 and a red. So despite the fact that Zergo just took down a Pro Tour, I, I'm going to say this again. One drops in Limited are, are often overrated because you don't – the advantage of Constructed of playing a one drop on turn one is you get to use your mana on turn one, then on turn two. In Limited, if you play a one drop on turn one, you're often just going to play nothing on turn two. That's right. And Zergo is just a much lower power level card than Nukud Cobra. In fact, I would I would take Tail Slash over Zergo as well. I would too. Yeah. I've never really been impressed by two twos and two ones in Limited. Uh, for for the reasons you said, basically you you can break it down on the quadrant theory as well if you want sort of a visual on that you know which is if you play it on turn one, the you know I think most people think that that's really exciting, and the fact is it's kind of not. Um, it's decent, like it's definitely its best case scenario, but oftentimes um, that that creature is going to get either outclassed or at least traded with very early. Uh, by as early as turn two, your opponent will have a creature down that can trade with it. So even if you weren't on the play, it might never get a clean attack, in which case you're just trading card for card with a slight mana uh, advantage for you. N- not a big deal, though. That That's kind of the key with that. Um, the And then, of course, if you look at it in terms of the other scenarios, when you're winning, it's okay. It's still not even that great. Uh, when you're losing, it's – especially Zergo Bell Striker is, is considerably – bad uh can't block with can't block creatures with power two or greater like a lot of times your your scenario with these cheap uh you know small creatures is well at least they get to chump block and it's like this guy doesn't even really get to do that so that's awful um and when you're a parody you know a two two ground creature uh that can that can't block a lot of important things certainly doesn't hold up its end of the bargain either so you can see that it doesn't hold up you know both on our you know kind of the eye test of just going, yeah, these things just don't really work for me. And also, if you take your time to to actually put it through the paces, it doesn't really hold up either. And, you know, if we want to compare that, for example, to a Kud Cobra, which I think is a card that both Luis and I would be taking out of this pack, um, now all of a sudden, it's different. Now, a Kud Cobra does tend to be in a, in a – want to be in a more defensive deck, but it does okay kind of wherever you put it. And, uh, you know, you look at it in terms of like a parody situation and a Coot Cobra can actually start attacking, which is kind of insane, uh, you know, that, that it can it, it sort of demands a two for one in many scenarios. Uh, if you're behind, it's quite nice. It's only four mana, so you're not in too bad of a spot. And it blocks in such a way that it can block and survive pretty often. 
um, you know, against most type of ground threats. And worst case scenario, it's going to trade for basically anything on the ground. That's pretty good. And, uh, you know, if, if you're ahead, whatever, like, again, ahead is like, as long as it's a affects the border does anything, you're, you're fine having it. And, and this certainly fills that role. And then in the developing stages, you know, which is where Zergo kind of is supposed to shine. But like I, like we described kind of doesn't, you know, Ukud Cobra is perfectly fine slotting in at four, being easy to cast at just single black and, uh, and kind of doing its job. So you can see that, you know, Ukud Cobra does much, much better on the, uh, on the quadrant theory than, than Zergo. Yeah, I think it's a <clears throat> hands down the pick here. All right, and I am going to give Zergo to Cardboard Crack when I send the uh, the package in that direction. Okay, main topic time, Luis. Yeah, um, let's do this. Yeah, so the Pro Tour. Um, we were – you and I were both over in Brussels uh, for about a week. You were there a little longer than I. And uh, and it was time for Pro Tour Dragons of Tarkir. Um, it was a cool event. Um, congratulations to our champion. That was Martin Dang from Denmark. And uh, he won, like you mentioned, with Zergo Bell Striker in his constructed deck. Um, but we wanted to talk. I wanted to pick your brain and kind of get you to let us know how testing went. Um, you tested with Team Channel Fireball. And, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of, of information that gets ran through in a relatively short period of time. And I thought it would be fun uh, and informative for the listeners to kind of get your perspective on how testing went and, and, you know, maybe some of the opinions that you saw and that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, a, a brief overview of, of my pro tour. Uh, I, I went 05. It's the worst pro tour performance I've ever had. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring it up. Uh, well, I mean, we're, we're here, right? It, it, it's actually hard to do worse than that in general, though. I suppose, uh, some people managed because they got disqualified. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, testing was interesting because, so the team came up, you know, uh, between Guillaume Matignon, Josh Adderley, and Paulo Vitor. These are some of the main guys in, in Waffle Top, actually. Uh, they came up with this Esper deck. This is more of a constructed thing, but yeah, it's fine. You know, they, the, the Esper deck that they played, the Dragon deck, I think might have been just the best deck in the tournament. Oh, it They're, was so sweet. Yeah. Uh, Raptor went 9-1. PV went 8-2. Paul Chiano went 8-2. And, uh, oh, I had- want to add to that, by the way. Uh, I am 4-1 in constructed two-mans with it, so... Well, the deck must be insane. So now you know for <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that that's great. I mean, the fact that they, you know, and I keep saying they because I didn't play the deck, uh, had the potentially the best deck in the tournament, you know, I think arguably definitely. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually convinced. Uh, of course, the problem is I, I, I didn't play it. I played Jeskai Tokens just because I like the deck more. And then, eh, I mean, it ended up being fine. It wasn't great. And uh, I actually lost to the 75 card mirror when I <laughs> played against Jesse Hampton. So I. Uh, I don't necessarily blame the, the that deck uh, on my performance. The fact that I owe through the draft was a little a little worse, but so testing for constructed went great for those who played that deck, and then testing for limited I actually just don't think went incredibly well. We've definitely had better showings in limited. I mean, but you, I haven't actually added up the whole record yet, but our overall record in limited was not good. And Interesting. So I think we're we're going to be taking some time to, to look at why that was the case and what we could do to improve that. I don't think we came out with a terrible understanding of the format or anything. I think in general, I, I did like that. But, you know, I, I feel like we didn't really get as far ahead as we could have. I, I think that there are – we did discover a couple of things which I think were interesting and I think maybe varied from like conventional knowledge in a good way. But overall, I didn't – I don't know. Maybe this is partially me personally. But, you know, I think if you look at our overall team record, I mean I, I told you these insane constructed records, right? None mm-hmm. of those guys made top eight. Two made top 16. But – you know, Paul, Paul went 2-4 uh, in limited. Uh, you know, Josh, even though he went 9-1 in constructed, he went 3-3 in limited. So, and PV went 4-2 in limited. This, these aren't like, you know, blowing the doors off records. So, right. I think looking at looking at what we did and how we could do it better is definitely part of the whole process. I think everyone, I mean, basically anything worth doing, you, you need to keep reevaluating. But I, I, I'd certainly love to talk about kind of where we landed on the format and what we think about it and kind of how I think that'll maybe change going forward. Yeah, so. you know, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, going back to the, the bigger picture before we dive into the Dragons of Tarkir specific stuff, what are your guys' goal? Like, obviously you want to – the end goal is to put up the, the highest, you know, win percentage or whatever possible to get as many wins at the Pro Tour as you can. But like taking one step away from that end goal – what is the team's vision for how to accomplish that? Like, is it a matter of trying to have a comprehensive understanding of how the format works as a whole so that 
I guess you can avoid pitfalls or know what to do when you get in there. Is it just an experience thing? Like, are you just trying to get as mu- as many drafts and as much experience under your belt so that when you, you know, sit down that you can roll with whatever punches are given you as far as colors and stuff? Like, how does the – what would be your ideal scenario going into, you know, a PT given the fact that you're you're under pretty serious time constraints? Well, I guess the at the base level, you have to figure out if this is like a very, very different than normal limited format. I mean, there there have been those in the past, right? You have formats uh, like, well, I mean, cons, you know, clearly is, is like a three color format where you have these these clans going on. If you you look even back a little further, you you have formats like Rise of the Eldrazi where mm-hmm. it's completely different where, you know, two mana two twos are almost just straight unplayable in Rise of the Eldrazi. And knowing knowing that sort of thing is, is, the, is important, especially since... You know, when you look at something like Scars of Mirrodin that has Infect and Poison, I mean, these are these are things that are just completely changing how the format works at a fundamental level. And you have to kind of first identify that. Okay, but, so the yeah, big, big picture stuff. Yeah, th- those those become pretty obvious because, first of all, <laughs> they're, obvi- they're usually set themes that are just made clear just, you know, when p- you look at the spoiler and how the set's like marketed even. And then the second is trying to get a se- sense of kind of what combinations of colors are draftable, what, you know, and what, what themes within the set are worth going for versus not. Like Exploit is, for example, a theme which is very much worth going for. Exploit's very clearly very good and might be the, you know, blue-black might be the best deck when it comes together. The the most granular, the you know, the, the one with, like, the highest specificity is trying to figure out how good each card is and how they rank. And that that obviously takes the longest because first of all you have to play with all the cards. Right. Uh, you usually, I mean, some cards you can just read and know that they're insane. Like you know, you look at Dragon Lord Silmgar or Dramoka or any Dragon Lord, and you're like, wow, this card's insane and limited. But when you look at a card like Conor for Strider or Tail Slash or uh, you know Sabretooth Outrider, like you look at these cards and 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 it takes you know some games before you know how good they are yeah especially when you add in things like megamorphs where like you're factoring in all different types of costs and things and it, it it's not always obvious at first blush exactly how those play out in a real game yeah exactly so you basically do you know you go top down you you look at like first the overarching themes of the set of the set see if there's anything weird going on then you look at the more specific themes of the set like which each the themes each color has and the different color pairs like you know, in in some formats, where because a, a quote unquote normal limited format has 10, 10 two color pairs, and generally you won't see much three color play. And sometimes you have normal limited formats where seven of the ten color pairs are draftable, and three of the ten are just really bad. And you have to kind of identify what those three are. And then at the lowest level, it's like wh- which cards are good, which cards are bad, kind of a general order for the cards. And you know, you also have to pick up synergies, and that's just that's. You know, the the breadth of the limited format is not something you can completely encapsulate before a Pro Tour. You only have two weeks or so. But, you know, a a month into drafting it, especially, you know, six weeks into drafting it, you you start knowing which combinations of cards are really good and when it really changes the value of some cards. And the the more of that you get before the Pro Tour, the better, clearly. But I think it's unrealistic to assume you're going to know every single thing about a format before you start playing. Right. And so when it comes to to getting down to the specific cards, right – how do you – like you've got a – how big was the team? 19 people? Something it's, like that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a whole lot of opinions, right? And I, and I realize that, you know, some people on the team, um, you know, are considered more of the, the limited people and, you know, than others, right? And so, you know, it's maybe not the full 19 all shouting at the top of their lungs about what cards they think are good or bad. But there's still multiple voices that need to be heard here. And I just want to know, like, how, how the heck do you guys – organize that like how do you turn you know four different people arguing about whether this card's better than the other into usable information you know for the team as a whole well that's part of the challenge and uh the, the funny thing is uh despite ben stark being you know one of a, a great limited mind uh the kind of the prevailing opinion of the team is that the limited discussion at least is a little easier to grok without ben there <laughs> yeah because <laughs> ben is you know he's loud and prone to hyperbole it and that's how he makes his points and that's how he argues. And I actually, you know, I, lo- I love Ben and I love talking with Ben and I get a lot out of it. But when you're in a room with 19 people, too many Ben Starks, especially Ben and the ben, the combination of Ben and Paulo is especially tough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the one and two punch. so dealing with, you know, not having to deal with that makes it a little easier. But yeah, that is one of the challenges is 
you have 19 people. And, and granted, it's not really 19 because – Maybe six or seven people probably don't talk at all or at least talk very little mm -hmm. just because that's just how different personalities are and, and sometimes people don't feel like they need to add something if the point's already been made. But trying to figure out how to get the useful, the mo most useful information out of everyone is, is really a challenge and some people don't respond well to group situations. So you, you, know, you have people that you kind of need to talk to beforehand or afterwards and try to get a good sense there because I mean – you know, my job as one of the people leading the team, and I, I did not do a good job this time that for various reasons, I, I think. It's something I have to reflect on. Uh, my job is trying to lead this conversation and guide it and get the most – extract the most good knowledge out of everyone as possible. And right. that, that's a tough balancing act and we've done it better sometimes than than worse than others. And uh, I think you know, one, one example of this is when we were going over the rares, which is kind of like near the end. Uh, Ephra was like, look, let's just say – have have Sigrist, you know, Mike Sigrist say what he thinks about the rares and if people disagree, they they'll, they can speak up then. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> part of the reason for that is shortcutting. I mean, uh, you know, Siggy is one of the people who's best at limited on the team and listening to him first makes a lot of sense. And when he didn't have experience with the rare, he said, I haven't played with this card. I don't know enough about this card. And then people who played with the card then then get to chime in. So I see. So that's good. I mean that, that seems like a pretty reasonable plan. Now, what's the – What's the result of all of that? Uh, so you know, you guys do yeah. pick order lists, or like, how does that work out? So the the idea clearly isn't to have just like a pick order list because I mean, in any good limited format, which they tend to have been pretty good recently, pick orders will change based on what you have. And in fact, in any limited format, that's true. Yeah. You know, sometimes a five drop is better than a three drop, but once you have two five drops, you can't just take a third five drop over a three drop, even if it's a better card. Right. And clearly, when you have cards like that have exploit or formidable or prowess. I mean, you then have to change the order you take cards in. And, and I think I talk about this every time pick orders come up, but the fact of the matter is pick orders are, are not that useful. Once things have started to get going, the idea behind kind of ranking all the cards. And I actually shared uh, with you the, the document where we kind of kept all this or our results. Yeah. I'm looking at it now. And the idea behind this document is, is there, well, there's a couple different ideas. The, the, the most basic one is, you need to know which rares are better than other, other cards or which cards you want to first pick because some, when you open a, a, a rare, odds are that you won't necessarily – especially a mythic, you won't necessarily have played with it directly. And if it's hard to evaluate, like there are some cards like you brought up Corpse Weft, for example. Like that that's a card we found to be quite good and knowing that without having played the card is not the easiest, especially since there's a lot of kind of garbagey enchantments that look like this card. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so – here you have to – this is part of the advantage of being on teams. You get to piggyback on the people who have played these cards. The second is by grouping cards in these approximate orders, you, you kind of get a sense of where they rank relatively, which means that even though you're not following a strict pick order, you kind of know where these different groups of cards lie. And that's kind of what the <clears> – the, one of the <clears> – <throat> excuse me – main uses of the document is. But the main use of the discussion is not just to come up with this document. This document is just kind of notes from that. Part of the just – you know, a big part of the discussion is trying to figure out what cards – what synergies are important, what color pairs are good, what decks you should be drafting, kind of what order the colors are. And uh, like for example, in this discussion, a lot of the people in the group had a kind of bias against green, for example, because we think that's the worst color. Mm -hmm. And if – and that being the case, even though we might rank – some green cards higher. Some people are like, I'm not going to take this green card, which we ranked slightly higher than this black card over the black card or even much higher because I don't want to be in green. And that's not universal across the team, certainly, but that's just kind of different people's opinions on the, on the different colors. And you, you have to try to figure out exactly where you land uh, on what, what decks you like to draft and what decks you're comfortable drafting. Another thing that comes up in pro tour preparation is uh, if you don't have enough time, Sometimes you want to shortcut by figuring out what color combinations or what decks that you know back and forth and just draft one of those decks. I think that overall is a lower win percentage than knowing how to draft everything. But knowing how to draft three decks 10 out of 10 and kind of sticking with those versus knowing how to draft every deck like three out of 10 is – I mean clearly it's better to, to draft those three decks. Right. What about, what about when it comes to uh, big picture information, right? Because – you know, it feels like one of the goals that you're trying to come away with here from all of this is uh, is getting that big picture snapshot of like you just mentioned that you guys felt like green was the worst color. And that's an important thing to know, right? Especially for somebody, 
you know, because remember, we're talking about a team dynamic here. So let's say that you've got one of the players on your team putting in many hours developing the constructed deck that ends up being kind of the team deck for, you know, for the Esper deck uh, ended up being the one that the majority of the players played, right? So let's say somebody's tweaking the sideboard for that for three or four days and, you know, running play tests and doing all that stuff. They might not have enough time, right, to really go deep on this draft format. So they're going to lean on their teammates to tell them, you know, to, 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 you know, the group information about, you know, which colors are good or which colors are bad. But you also have to end up making some pretty sweeping claims in order to do that. And it, it feels like that's a specific skill, right? Like I know for me, um, I like to let this kind of come to me, right? Like I, I mean, I can look at the, um, I can just break down the cards by color and just look at how many I would consider very powerful, powerful, not very good, bad, you know, just kind of lump them. And that gives you a snapshot for sure. But things play out differently sometimes, you know, in the actual format. And for me, like, I'm not one that likes to jump in and make big sweeping proclamations until I've really had a chance to, to experience it all and and really understand it. But you guys don't have that luxury. Uh, You know, the testing for the pro tour, you've got a couple of weeks at most. And, uh, you know, it's one of those scenarios where you don't get to just sit there and kind of absorb everything. So my question is, you know, what kind of skill sets do you look for for teammates for stuff like this? Is it that big picture stuff? What about the individual card, you know, level? Like, what are you looking for there? There, there aren't that many people who can take a limited format and it, with limited time really give you a good overview of it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, when we find people like that, obviously that's great. You know, Sigrist, Efro, I think is another good example. He's fantastic at limited. Uh, ben S was one of those people as well. But in general – one way to get this context, I mean, you're saying you, you wait for, you know, you kind of draft until you absorb all this. And that yeah. is, that is, I think, generally the best way to personally to do it. But one way to kind of shortcut that is get 19 or 16 or however many people and just draft nonstop for a week. And you, the accumulated games over in drafts by the total number of people will really help. And so just having people who are, you know, good at magic and, 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 can, and can articulate their thoughts. It is important, even if they're not necessarily going to crack the code all by themselves. You know, every piece of information, if you can put it together well, helps. And sometimes there's dissent, of course. I mean, some people like different things. Some people just disagree with each other. Some people evaluate things incorrectly, you know, and you have to kind of filter through all that. But one way to get a sense, because, you know, you're trying to break the format. You're trying to get, understand it as best you can. And one way to do that is you just get a lot of games in because, these things are complicated and it's hard to look at, to figure it out by just reading the cards. And it's hard to figure out by doing five drafts. You have to do more than that. So right. even if not everyone is insane at limited, they're, you know, if they're playing on the pro tour, if they're on these teams, they're going to be good. So what kind of conclusions did you guys come up with for this particular format? I'm just, I'm curious that, you know, to, to hear your, your thoughts and, and kind of what the, you mentioned that you guys kind of decided that green was on the bottom, but you know, how, how did things go, um, you know, for dragons? So Dragons is interesting. It, it, it is, again, the most normal limited format we've had for a while because it's not a lot of colors. It's yeah. got some some light themes, I would say, because in general, you're just kind of drafting a curve and cards that are good and cards that are, you know, d- don't rely on a ton of synergy. There's just not that much reward for drafting synergy here. Some Some synergy is rewarded. There are specific cards that you really want, especially, and, and there are some decks that, you know, work a lot better once you have the the important synergies but in general like you're taking you know summit prowlers because they're four mana four threes and you're taking tail slashes because it kills their opponent's creature and, yeah <laughs> <laughs> pretty straightforward there and and that's fine it, it is it feels like good magic I, I i've enjoyed the format I, I anticipate doing more i actually did a 64 player draft yesterday it took <laughs> almost five hours but it was fun oh one of them ones on magic online <laughs> yeah where you have to if you three of the first draft you get to do the second draft so it's you know, 64 people down to eight, and then the eight is the second draft. So I uh, <laughs> actually tweeted a screenshot of uh, my opening hand with my second deck because I managed to make it to the second draft of uh, uh, Island, Swamp, Mountain, uh, Dragon Lord Dromoka, and uh, Blue and Black cards. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that does not sound like it's going anywhere good. Well, I won the draft pretty easily. Actually. Of course, you did. <laughs> Sixty-four players entered. One, one very greedy player left. But uh, <laughs> did did you win the whole thing? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> uh, you're a monster. Basically, I was just like a like a black green deck, 
splashing a uh, green white green white or sorry green red blue uh, <laughs> i had two two evolving wilds and like three lands and uh some germag drowners so yeah it, it was great anyway uh, that's impressive <laughs> so so one of our main conclusions coming out of it is that there was nothing that was going on that was too under the surface that was really going to give you a huge edge it's not like we discovered the spider spawning deck or right. discovered, you know, like the token shared discovery deck in Rise of the Eldrazi. And I don't – I didn't – from watching other people draft, I don't think anyone else did either. There wasn't – I mean just the cards aren't there to draft anything too bizarre. I, I think the edges in this format come from, well, first of all, knowing the relative values of the cards and, and also just drafting cohesive decks and playing well. And but there's nothing wrong with that. I, I like formats like that. So Yeah, I like that too. It rewards solid limited play basically. Yeah, I, I think one of the – one of the main things that changed between this and the last couple formats is uh, the impact of rares is a little lessened. Uh, the the rares in uh, dragons were less ridiculous than Fate Forge. I think Fate Forge is going to be the most ridiculous we've seen in for a while, and hopefully that's the case because I wouldn't want to see what happens when you go up from there. Right. And and what that means is is first of all you can abandon cards a little easier because you're less likely to have first pick a rare you have to play, and. Second, and here's here's something where I messed this up. Well, maybe you messed it up. I, I'm actually not clear yet. In my first draft, which is you really don't want to be in the same colors as the person to your right, whereas like in cons, uh, Fate Reforged, maybe that didn't matter as much. But here, sometimes the person to your right opens Citadel Siege and passes it to you, which literally did happen, and I was in white. And uh, the person on my left got a third pick Citadel Siege, fourth pick Elite Scale Guard. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, they didn't put it to great use because they beat me in the O2 bracket. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that was one of the things is in in the previous format, you'd never get – first of all, Fate of Force is first. So you first obviously never get past Fate, Citadel Siege. Second of all, when your opponent opened like a Dune Blast, if they were like two of those colors, which they often were if there are three colors, they'd just pick up Dune Blast and pick up a couple lands. Yep. Now when your opponent opens or when the person passing you opens, you know, Citadel Siege or Palace Siege or, or what have you, they, they're – Gonna have to pass it, you know. You, if you're if you're like red green, you're not taking a double white card. You just can't play the card, right. and that that means that reading what the person to your right is is playing is, is pretty important. In my particular case, I knew white was open, but I, there still weren't good white cards back one, so I could have switched with the hope of this happening. But it didn't seem like it was worth it because I was getting good cards in other colors too. Uh, I mean, I, hindsight is twenty twenty, so I'm not saying. I should have because I saw Citadel Siege, but maybe I should have. Because maybe the the density of good cards in pack three is worth it. I don't know. So yeah, white is the best color there. It is, and uh, so yeah, not being in the colors of the person you're right is a higher priority now than it was before. And uh, pretty much all the two color combinations are at the very least draftable. Some are better than others. Like blue black is is quite good, uh, and you, I think you you, you can. Be the enemy color combinations to pick up the Fate Reforged cards, like Groom Contest and Harsh Sustenance being the most important. But you don't have to. That's just an additional bonus. It's not something you should be like be completely relying on. Right. What What about um, – do you guys – like what, what kind of discussion goes into – so you, you mentioned the blue-black deck, for example. And that seems to be kind of the most obviously good deck. Um, you know, people played it early, early, early in the format and were like, wow, this is sweet. I'm getting so much value. And there's, uh, you know, a lot of sort of one-two punches with cards that are pretty easy to see for experienced limited players. You know, we were talking about it, you and I, on the show real early as well. Um, do you guys have a stance on, okay, well, everybody's going to be trying to draft this, so we should not? Um, I mean, obviously, you wouldn't set a hard rule for yourself, but like, are you looking to avoid certain things because you feel like they'll be overdrafted, or do you feel like the pro tour crowd it still isn't won't be you know up to date enough to you know ha to already know that kind of thing? Well, it, it's draft is self correcting, so yeah. It, if let's say blue black was like ten times better than every other color combination, I mean it's not, but let's say it was, it doesn't mean that you should always avoid it or always draft it. It just means you should try to figure out whether it's, it's actually open. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's worth kind of forcing, like it doesn't happen too often, but in some formats, you know, like going all the way back to Urza saga, for example, where mono black could support five people at the table, uh, right. there, there might be worth forcing it. But here, I mean, we found things that were good that we thought other people would know, but we didn't want to stay away from them because of that, nor did we want to go after them actively because of that. I, I think, in general, you, you do 
you do just have to kind of read the table. It's not – there's nothing going on that's so absurd that I thought too many people were going to draft it or that I thought I, I needed to always be in it. Yeah. You know, it was funny. We, we watched uh, – on coverage, we watched Shahar draft. And it became very apparent to me that he was really not interested in going into green. Um, yes. And, you know, he, he started off with a couple of white and black cards, decent stuff, but nothing great, and ended up getting, you know, something like a fifth pick-ish. Like it was either fourth, fifth, or sixth. I can't remember. Um, Elmer, you know, stampeding Elkert, right? And he took – something mediocre in, in white or green over it. Now I like, I like stamping an elk herd quite a bit. Um, even if it is in, in the color that doesn't have the, the most depth, I'm like, Oh, that's, that stands out to me as a card. And I'm like, Oh, well, that's, that's yeah, interesting it, that that's still here. And then another it, one came the next pack for too. Sure. Yeah. And then the next, and then the next pack had another one in it. And Shahar again took, you know, something just sort of shrug worthy in, in his colors and it was obvious at that point that green was open. There was another decent green card in that pack as well. And he clearly did not want to move into green, like staunchly so, uh, because it seemed like that was the seat he was in was the one that should have been in green. Um, but it was interesting to watch because, you know, I hadn't talked to you yet about this, about your guys' conclusions on it. And, you know, when I was watching it, and in my opinion now, I think green's okay. It might be the worst color, but you know, uh, we've seen formats where there's colors that are basically unplayable because they lack depth. And I don't think the green is in that category here. It's just the worst of the the five. Um, and I would have jumped ship in a heartbeat. Um, but Shahar knew something that I didn't at the time, which is that green is really, you know, the lowest on the totem pole. And even though he's found a couple of nice little gems a little late, um, he would be committing quite hard, right? They're double green each. And so he would be really moving in and he didn't want to do it. And I thought that was really interesting just to now that I see your guys' list to sort of reverse engineer it back to, to what Shahar was thinking when he was at the table. Yeah. Without knowing exactly what Shahar was taking, cause I, I haven't seen this draft of his, yeah. I don't, I don't know whether I would have jumped ship or not. I mean, even though I don't like greens, I certainly will draft it. It's not like it's undraftable. There's no, again, this is all just kind of like a range like I think green is the worst color, but I also don't think it's so bad that I'll take like, you know, a, a very mediocre card over something like a Stampeding Elk Herd or an Airy Bowmasters. I, I mean, those cards are just quite good. There's yeah, you, sh- you shouldn't you shouldn't just be deathly afraid of them. So yeah, I mean, he might have a slightly higher sense of that, or he might be you know in the spot where I won't draft green. I don't think Charles necessarily there, but he might be like well. It's kind of like there's a there's a hidden modifier where you'll take you know a red card that's a five out of ten over a green card that's seven out of ten because you think the red modifier is plus three, right? Um, Team Ultra Pro, yes, they so had some different card evaluations from you guys. Yeah, I got a chance to chat with uh, Ben a little bit. So the Team Ultra Pro has like Ben Stark, Pat Cox, uh, Adrian Sullivan who top aided. Uh, Sam Black, Justin Cohen, Paul Rietzel, Matt Sperling, Andrew Beckstrom, and Matt Severa, and probably some other people I'm missing. My apologies to them, uh, but th- those are the people I can recall <laughs> off the top of my head there. Mm-hmm. And uh, a couple cards that they they thought were a lot better. They they thought Coat with Venom, the you know one black for plus one plus two and Death Touch was basically tied with Flatten for the best black common. Oh baby, which is way different than we had it though. I, I will say, and I said this when I talked to Ben, on our team I argued for Coat a little higher than most people, but not to the point where I thought it was as good as Flat. So Man, yeah, I, I have Coat. I, I, I love that card. I, I think that Coat with Venom is very, very strong. I think you're getting way more than your return for the mana, and it, te- and it tends to win the fights that it needs to win, um, but it's not flattened. Yeah, and their their logic is that it's, you know, first of all, it's incredibly mana efficient. Second of all, it leads to just like, huge blowouts when your opponent has cards like Epic Confrontation, you know, any fight card. And uh, it can save a creature from a damaging spell. And it just does enough things good that – or enough things well that you – that it's it's worth being up there. I still am not going to take this card over Flatten or even that near Flatten. But, I mean, clearly it's a good card. So it was interesting listening to them talk about that. And Ben was pretty sure on that. The second one, he was less sure on, but he had to convince his teammates not to be like third picking, which was a Conifer Strider. And uh, 
you know, the five one hex proof. Right. I have more respect for this card than I did. I will admit that. I, when I first saw the card, you know, we, we did not give it a very high grade. Yeah. Turns, turns out there are enough ways to to bolster it, you know, both literally and figuratively that uh, it, mm-hmm. that uh, it's going to do the job. I still am not going to be taking the super early, but it, it's a fine card. So how does that work? Did you guys talk after the the drafts were done? Is that because I, I never really quite like I, I'm around you guys quite a bit, but I, I don't know what the you know kind of the code of ethics is as far as revealing information. I know some of the teams take that very very seriously. You know, most of the you know high level teams like you guys and Pantheon and stuff um, about you know revealing information that you've learned during play testing, but it after the drafts are done, does it, the, the curtain kind of goes up and you guys can chat or is that something that you feel comfortable uh, chatting with Ben about even before the PT because whatever? We we certainly don't chat before the PT. It's a little weird not talking with like Ben or Pat before Pro Tours now because I always talk with those guys and, you know, I've yeah, texted them for friends. years. Yeah. Yeah. But regardless, before the Pro Tour, we pretty much don't talk uh, just because, you know, not only – do we not want to give other, you know, like betray the confidence of our team? It's also mm-hmm. like part of the reason we're on different teams is to each team is trying to figure out their own way. And I think, you know, I, I think it's more interesting when when all the teams do that. But yes, once the once the second draft is done, basically, there's some talk after the first draft. Like all, you know, Ben looked at my deck after the first draft, and you know we talked about it and stuff like that. We're not like, you know, trying to preserve state secrets here. But after a second draft, yeah, we certainly give each other a rundown on the format. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is it's interesting. We want to talk about magic, and this is a interesting, hard to decipher thing about magic that we could talk about. This is one of the most interesting parts about the Pro Tours figuring out the limited format. The second is that it really does increase our knowledge. It makes us better at doing this thing because we talk with Ben, and let's say we end up disagreeing, like with Coat of Venom. Mm-hmm. It's still really useful for us to listen to why he thinks it's that good and listen to why their team came to this conclusion. Maybe it's less useful for Ben because Ben doesn't change his mind quite as often, <laughs> but. <laughs> But it is interesting to talk about people with different valuations and, and think why they come to this valuation, whether you think they're right or wrong. And talking with people who are really good at it is definitely going to help you improve your valuations in the future. Yeah, so. that's something I always I, – I've actually I, – I actually wrote a column about that. In fact, uh, just about being open-minded, about listening to other people's opinions, uh, though th- that was with the caveat that you don't have to actually take their advice – Right, you don't have to listen to what they say as if it were true or that it's correct. But I've always found that it's better just to listen to what the other person has to say, uh, and then there's usually at least some pieces of truth or uh, knowledge that you might not have had in there, even if ultimately their conclusion isn't where you end up. That's okay. Like you don't you don't have to listen to every you know the, the, people are going to give you advice that's bad they're going to have not considered things that you've considered that's going to happen and and that's okay um but i do i i found that for my magic and, and and in life as well but you know especially for magic is that like i'll listen to almost anybody's opinion on the thing because it it actually helps me frame how other people are viewing the format too which is really important i mean Look, if you think one deck is really great, but everybody else does too, it doesn't really give you that much information or that much of an edge because if everybody knows it, then it's it's a, it's public knowledge and you're not really ahead of the curve. But you know, it, and and listening to what somebody else says can give you an idea of what you know the air quotes public knowledge on a situation is. Again, even if you happen to disagree with it, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, and then there's there's lots of different sources of information and. You know, think of Pro Tours as professional development conferences. You get to, (laughs) you know, and and you get the benefit of this too. You get to watch from the booth, which is, you know, a slightly different perspective, but you're still on the floor. You still get to talk to people and talking with all these, you know, magic minds, you know, from from the greatest to the, you know, quite good to whatever. Like there's, there is a range because obviously there's always a range, but you're going to talk to a lot of good, interesting viewpoints and you have to filter it. You have to decide what you think is correct and what you do not. And sometimes you're wrong, sometimes you're right. But going through this process is really important. And yeah, I mean, trying to figure out how to get better is something you always should be struggling with. And talking with people like Ben Stark or like Sam Black or like, uh, you know, the guys from the Pantheon, like Huey, for example, is obviously incredible at Limited. And even if you disagree, like, you know, Sam, for example, is someone who has often very unconventional views on Limited. And as someone who likes unconventional things, I like talking to him sometimes, even if I often don't agree with his, the conclusions he's come to. So 
figuring out stuff like that is is really important. And yeah, w- not everyone has the opportunity to go to the pro tour itself, but you get to do stuff like listen to this podcast. We were both at the pro tour. We, you know, I, I was testing for it. You were doing coverage for it. We both get to talk to these people and listening to kind of the lessons from there, reading articles that people write. These these are ways to kind of get a get the advantage from that. And even at the like local level, talking with people who you respect who play limited is important. And even if you don't end up agreeing with them, listening to their processes is a big part of it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it, it also puts a specific focus, I think on the way that people communicate. And that's funny, you know, cause in many ways that those are the people that I've gravitated towards personally, you know, um, it was one of the things I really liked about you, uh, when I first met you, you know, is, is that you're, you're somebody who's able to adjust the conversation in a way that is reasonable. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, I've seen so many magic players, especially ones that are with less experience, get into, you know, borderline yelling matches about cards and about which one's better than the other, right? Oh, no, this one's better. No, 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 this one's better. And they start, you know, yelling about which one's better. And and they get into this like heated discussion, um, trying to figure it out. But I feel like if I were to have that conversation with you and we disagreed, we would probably look at each other and go, yeah, but either way, they're within like 20% of each other, right? Like, if you're right, it's 80% as good as the one that I think is better. And if and if it's flipped, it's the other way. And so it's like shrug, right? Like whatever. It, it's somewhere in there. And maybe, you know, you're correct. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I am. But the point is that we were able to recognize that the crux of the thing isn't just strictly labeling which is better. It's that, okay, well, we're close, right? And And now we can move on to the next thing. And, you know, I always talk about it on the show and, and even in the column and stuff about – you know, sort of the dangers of hyperbole, which is, which is rampant in magic. And, you know, you mentioned it with like Ben Stark and, you know, Ben's the type of guy that once you get to know him, you kind of adjust your own filter for him and some of the stuff that he says, um, or I shouldn't say some of the stuff, the way that he says some things and you're like, well, I know what he means. Um, but you know, for somebody that you don't know, especially if you're trying to get your point across to somebody who, who you're not really familiar with, uh, on that level, it, the hyperbole just completely clunks everything up. It just gets in the way in such a, a massive way where there's no granularity, right? I, I view things <laughs> yeah. as a scale, you know, it's everything's on a scale, you know, when we're talking about cards and when we're talking about things relative to each other, where I think that the hyperbolic stuff ends up being, um, very much black and white, you know, on and off switches. It's just like, it's either great or it's terrible. And that is just such a, a useless way, you know, to look at, at, at our game and at cards for it as well. And I think that, you know, it is funny to note the people that I listen to more than the people that I don't, even though the peop- some of the people that I don't, they're probably really good. They probably have reasonable things to say. They just aren't very good at presenting them, you know? And that's, that's something that I hold very dear because it makes me feel like I can have a rational conversation with a person where even if we were to disagree, we can meet, you know, like I said, somewhere in the middle. I think next time we get in an argument, I'm going to start yelling. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to go off. Yeah. All right. I'm in for that. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm curious. I want to see what that's like. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen you yell at anybody. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, you're not much of a yeller. All right, man. Uh, why don't we Why don't we wrap this thing up? Uh, any closing thoughts on the uh, on testing or the PT or the format or anything? Uh, no, I'm I'm interested in exploring where the format goes from here. It doesn't seem like there's super incredibly complicated secrets to decipher, but getting those edges by n- learning the format is definitely going to happen. I mean, I, yeah. I think I think as you know. As we, as the listeners, as we draft, you know, the world at large drafts for the next month or two months or three months and gets better and better, I think, you know, we're going to, other emerging truths will happen and I'm sure there's tons more to talk about because, you know, we, we started to look at like the overall picture of the format and kind of, you know, we have a sense of what cards are good and what cards aren't, but trying to figure out like dialing in our, our knowledge and making it much more uh, kind of complete is just still, is a process that's still going to keep happening. Yeah, for sure. Um, before we do take off, I've got a couple of uh, little up, update and story things I wanted to tell before we take off. Um, the first one is the modern rotisserie draft. We talked about this on the show a little bit. I talked about <sighs> it with BDM as well. And uh, we did our matches and it's done. Uh, I put my matches up on uh, on the blog uh, and also on the um, YouTube channel 
uh, if you haven't checked it out, by the way, Limited Resources does have a YouTube channel. I put all the episodes of the show up there. It's also where you can find the uh, the visual uh, set reviews where I put the the card names as, or the pictures of the cards as we talk about them. Um, that's, by the way, another thing that's brought to you by effectively the Patreon um, that, you know, has allowed me to free up that time to make sure I can do it because it, it's quite time consuming. But um, they they end up pretty cool uh, to, to be able to just like look at the cards as they go through. And anyway, I put up the uh, the modern rotisserie thing. And why did you sigh when I said that? Oh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Marshall's anyway, me- messaging me all day. Hey, dude, you see, I won the modern resistance. I did not do anything of the sort. <laughs> I got like three emails, two text messages, oh, and a couple Twitter, Twitter direct messages. Why do I put up with this? <laughs> uh, I want it. Uh, spoiler alert. But y- if you want to watch the matches, which is really what I wanted to talk about, because uh, they ended up being uh, quite interesting, uh, because what would happen is. Uh, after my match was finished, I would watch the others because it was just in spectator mode on Magic Online. And there was some insane games. And I, I had some really cool close games as well with a lot of neat stuff happening. But really some of the other games I was watching too, Sam's Black, Sam Black's deck was kind of insane. And uh, and there was all types of uh, shenanigans afoot. And it was really a, a fun uh, format to do. And I, I mentioned it on the show when we talked about it before, but a lot of other people have started doing them. There's five or six groups doing these modern rotisserie drafts, including our own group on the uh, on the LR subreddit and, and a bunch of others. But I have to say that after having played it out, it was really interesting. Um, the game, the draft, the decks were significantly different than each other and played out in pretty cool ways. It reminded me of Cube, which is kind of where I was aiming, um, but not quite. It has a different vibe to it for sure. Um, and I just wanted to say, I would recommend doing it. Like these things are not that hard to get together. Uh, cause one of the really cool things about it is that like, if you have, you know, let's say you're going to do it with eight people. If you've got eight friends that, and, and, you know, even four or five of them play on magic online, you're probably going to have the cards you need. Cause it's singleton format. So you only need one of each card and, you know, you're taking a, some of the cards are, you know, pretty expensive on Magic Online, no doubt about it. But if if you've played on there and if, especially if any of them play modern, uh, you're going to be able to get the cards and you can just loan them out to each other to play the matches. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to say that uh, I would recommend it after having now gone through the whole process of us, you know, considering it in that restaurant in Cleveland and then doing the draft process, which took about, I don't know, a week and a half or two weeks or whatever. Uh, but but generated a ton of interesting discussion and fun. Uh, and then having played out the matches to uh, it lived up. I think it was worth the time and it, and it was really cool. So I'd recommend it. The so, other, so, so, someone, someone who three yeah, enjoy, enjoyed, enjoyed the draft. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I, I, I actually found it interesting. Like I really did. All right, all right, look, I look, also look, enjoyed I, winning it. But. <laughs> I will have to admit your, your modern North history draft looked like it was a lot smoother than the vintage one. I remember saying I had kind of mixed feelings about like, the time commitment, but part of it is that mm-hmm. when we did our vintage rotisserie draft now, four or five years ago, four years ago or so, we had to put the the cards together in paper because there was not vintage online. So if we could have put all our decks together online and then played without having to be in the same place, yeah, that would have you know made it tenfold easier to, to actually play out the matches. So I'm kind of interested in actually doing this at some point. Yeah, you know, because I think one of the main differences there is so we decided to do them all together because um, we wanted to stream them, you know, because people had been following the draft and we thought it would be fun to stream them. But you know what else you can do? You can post the bracket with your friends at the beginning of the week and say, you know, Elmer, you're playing against Shelly. You guys get together at some time during the week, play your match and report it back to me, you know, and, and you can schedule it yourself and do it yourself, you know? So it can be one of those things. That's not this high pressure, you know, you got to carve out time. Think of it more along the lines of like a fantasy sports team where it's kind of a slow, you know, slow burn that generates a lot of discussion and, and fun with your group of friends where you can, you know, talk crap during the week and, you know, you get a lot, you get the brags if you want or, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm really not interested in either of those. No, that's not the part that you're, (laughs) (laughs) anyway, so I recommend doing it, uh, really fun, especially if you can sync it up on magic online. The other thing I wanted to mention though, was a cool format that I think Luis, you've I, I have some memory of you having done this before, but this is the first time I had experience with it. So we're uh, at dinner after the pro tour. Uh, it's all over. And, uh, you know, we're having a big sort of coverage dinner. 
And oh, I'm thanks, at for a, the, thanks for the invite. Uh, hey, dude, <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> so <laughs> I wish the listeners had any clue. <laughs> I'm sure they do. But anyway, so, so we're at this dinner and, uh, and I'm at a table uh, that's kind of broken off from the – there's one really long table and then I'm at, and I'm at a table with uh, with Nate Holt and we're over there chatting and hanging out. And and I think Rashad was there too. Yeah. Anyway, and they – and and BDM's at the, at the main table and he yells at me. He's like, hey, Marshall. I'm like, what? He's like, do you want to be the judge? And I'm like, sure. Like I'm out of it. I'm tired. It's been a long weekend or whatever. I'm like, I, I don't care. Yeah, whatever. And he's like, sweet. And I don't really know what I'm signing up for, but I find out a few minutes later, which is uh, the players. So since we were at a restaurant, we weren't going to be there for a long time. And they wanted to draft, right? Everybody, you know, when you're in the booth all weekend and you're watching people play magic, it's just, you, you can't wait to get out and, and actually play yourself. So somebody had brought product for them to draft with, but they were worried that they weren't going to be able to actually play out all the matches because we had to go back to the hotel, which was about a 20 minute walk away. And on the, on, when the pro tour is over, you know, some people just end up going to bed cause they're tired or got to catch an early flight, or maybe they're going to go meet a friend in the city that they don't get to see or whatever. So, you know, sometimes it can be tough to transfer the draft part over, you know, to a separate location and actually be able to get all the games in. So what they decided to do instead was, they all drafted decks normally, and then those decks would be presented to a judge, which ended up being me, and I would judge the decks and 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 decide who won the draft. <laughs> and so what they did is they drafted eight decks, and then uh, they put them in a bracket, an uh, imaginary random bracket. And so decks got paired against each other. Um, as it turned out, there was, ended up actually being 10 players in the draft. So I went through each of the decks and had to just eliminate the worst two, which was kind of brutal. Um, but then the, the eight remaining, like I said, get put into a random bracket. So it's this, this deck versus this deck. And this is, this makes it pretty cool. I don't get to know who's is who. So they're all sitting at the end of the table as I fan out, you know, the deck that they've drafted potentially, and I'm about to pass judgment on it without playing a single game about which deck would actually win. <laughs> and uh, I got to tell you, that was intense. It it sounded like kind of cool to me, but oh my God, like people get so into it. We had people yelling at me. Like I had people yelling at me, you know, no, my deck's way better. I've got a one drop. And I'm just like, what? easy there. And, uh, you know, trying to plead their case after the, after they had lost or whatever. And, uh, it was super fun. Um, and it ended up being Ben Hayes that won. I, he, he works in R and D at wizards and I got to give him credit. He drafted an absolutely beautiful, uh, red green deck that splashed blue for Sarkon and it had and a dragon or something. And it had uh, five mana fixing lands. I gave him extra credit for that because his mana was so smooth. And uh, anyway, if you find yourself in a situation where you might not be able to finish the games and you have an extra friend, designate them the captain and, uh, <laughs> and let the hilarity ensue. Cause I guarantee you're going to get a lot of <laughs> entertainment value out of it and, and some fights. You might lose a friendship, but it's probably worth it. It was really fun. So yeah, we, we did this about a year ago. It was slightly different. Mm -hmm. So what happened is we drafted and as is not uncommon among team channel fireball, we decided we actually wanted to eat. <laughs> 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 and we're, we're in Vegas we're at Efro's place and we had you know we, we drafted you know eight of us or whatever and we're like man we just finished drafting but it's, we're actually all like very hungry so what we decided to do was we would do, divide into random teams each player would build their deck and then the group as a whole would determine which record every deck should have <laughs> <laughs> So and this and this was in the interest of getting to dinner sooner. <laughs> yes, that was the, that was the, the, the main goal. <laughs> this is too good. <laughs> but before we did this, we had a pact, which was because Ben Ben Stark wasn't there. To oh, not okay. Tell, well, that changes not, things. Not tell Ben because if Ben heard about this, he would never play out a game of draft again. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh god, that's great. We split up the teams. Pat Cox ended up three owing on his team, and I ended up going o three. <laughs> <laughs> and, and his team won. <laughs> oh, that's that's amazing. And we finished the draft fairly quickly. 
<laughs> yeah, so it actually worked. Yeah, you know, the funny part was they knew I was the judge and multiple of them drafted to appease me. <laughs> like they tried to draft a deck that they thought I would like. And uh, and it was funny because uh, some of it worked. Uh, some of them committed really hard like BDM. He drafted a blue-white deck that had mystical teachings. That's what it's called, right? Sky, Skywise. Skywise teachings, right, of course. Uh, so he had Skywise teachings and he was trying to go off. He had like three or four student of Ojitai. And I got to look at the sideboard too. And he had like some really good cards in the sideboard that were on color, like Ojitai Interceptor and a couple of cards like that, that he was playing like refocus over <laughs> because he wanted to be able to trigger all of his stuff and stay committed to his cause. He also um, first picked um, – what's the uh, the one drop white that picks up counters when you play non-creature, mystic lore, living – Mystery. What is it? Living lore. Oh, you're talking about myth realized. Myth realized. Yeah, yeah. And he, so he had that, and he was trying to go off with that, and and like Blake uh, drafted Blake Rasmussen. He's he runs um, the website. He's the editor for Daily MTG. He drafted an insane impact tremors deck where he had three of those, and I ended up counting. He had 12 dash creatures, including Colagon in the deck. <laughs> he went real deep. Um, and interestingly, these two decks ended up meeting in the semifinals. And this was Rashad and I kind of uh, were the ones who were, you know, each taking a deck and kind of presenting the case for it. And uh, Rashad talked, just barely talked me into BDM's deck winning. Um, but I was actually on on Blake's deck winning. But but. It was really close. So we had to make a decision and, and, and said that Blake's deck won. And uh, Blake flipped out. He was, he was very unhappy with the ruling. And they ended up playing the decks um, a little later. And, uh, and BDM won two games to one. But, you know, it was, it was pretty close as well. And uh, anyway, uh, if, if you're bored and you want to fight with your friends, uh, this is a good way to do it. Um, <laughs> so in conclusion – uh, remember, uh, limited resources is brought to you by channel fireball.com every week. You can check out grand prix vegas.com. If you're planning on attending that event, which you definitely should be, if it's, if it's within a flight for you. Um, and also of course you can check out all the normal great stuff on channel fireball, including articles and videos from some of the best players in the world and, uh, great prices and a big selection on all of the singles and sealed product that you could ever need for your drafts or maybe to fill out that standard deck or your commander deck or whatever it is that you have. Um, that's going to do it for this week. If you want to find us on Twitter, I am Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. Very easy to do. Again, you can shoot us an email at uh, LR at LRcast.com if you want to find us there. And uh, I mentioned uh, in the show notes, I'll have uh, a link to the t-shirts, the LR t-shirts that are available on CFB now. And also I'll put up a link to the modern rotisserie draft that we did. Um, just in case you hadn't seen it, you can use that spreadsheet, um, for your own draft. You can just erase the names and the picks and just use it as a template to do your own. That way you can, it, it'll save you a little bit of time and, you know, get, get seven of your other friends together and, uh, and do a little drafting. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out. We'll talk to you next week. So for my sign off tonight, I actually kind of wanted to launch a somewhat new segment, and that that would be story time. Uh, that's, Ooh, I love story time. It's it, that's what you we have all good call, stories too. T- telling random stories, and uh, you know, given that I like I said, I've been playing Magic for a long time, I've run into a number of uh, fairly unique situations, and this <laughs> seems as good a platform as any to to talk about them. Uh, so let's let's just get right into it. So the first story uh, actually happened in Kyoto. This was a uh, at Pro Tour Kyoto 2006, Paul Chan and I, as <laughs> in a tradition that continues to this very day, both didn't make day two. <laughs> <laughs> and we played in a two-headed giant tournament where the first prize is uh, Kobe beef. It was a Kobe beef dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so Somehow you guys ended up there. Yeah, that, that I can see that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, playing for food obviously is our best, right. our best thing. Anyway, this story – Yes. This story actually doesn't come from our match, but but this happened in the tournament. So it's two at a giant, which means a game loss is a match loss because the, the each round is only one game. Mm-hmm. So what happened is one of the teams there played a Riftwing Cloudscape face down as a morph. So what Riftwing Cloudscape is, it's a 2-2, and then when it comes to play, it returns a, any permanent to the owner's hand. 
Mm-hmm. And it has suspend, so you can pay two men and suspend it for three turns, then it comes in. Well, the set had just come out, and I guess the person who had it played it as a morph. They thought it oh, cost no. three, three to morph and two to flip up. So they morphed it, and then like a few turns later, they're like, all right, unmorph my Rift and Cloudscape, bounce your permanent. And the, the opponent's like, well, that's not what that card does. So they call the judge. Oh, no. And the judge is like, the judges come in, they discuss, and they're like, well, normally this would be a game loss, but if we give you a game loss, that's just giving you a match loss. We don't really want to do that. <laughs> so the the result was the Riftwing Cloudscape got returned to its owner's hand, and that team lost ten life. <laughs> <laughs> what? That was the penalty that was assessed. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. So it was Whoa. like it was so it was like well this isn't a, a game loss but it's going to be a game disadvantage. You know and that's funny because don't you start at thirty. Life? No, that's you, something else. Or do you? you? You do. So that's and, actually a third of a match, right? <laughs> like, in if you do the math, like, yeah. if a game is a third of a match, then 10 life and you're only playing one game is a third of a match. It, math checks out. Yeah. So the fun, the, the, the kicker <laughs> is that the person who whose hand it got returned to then had to discard because they had eight cards in hand <laughs> and discarded a card with madness and paid the madness cost to play the card. <laughs> <laughs> No way. So let's just say, let's just say, that happened. <laughs> is a debacle. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Uh, I'm sure the opponents weren't very happy about that sequence. Yeah, it, it was pretty absurd. So also in in, in a, a bit of good news, Paul and I actually ended up winning the tournament and enjoying our uh, Kobe beef. So. Yeah, I was just going to ask, what, what, yeah, no. did did it come packaged or was it like a meal or? No, it, it was a meal. It was at a local restaurant. Oh, there was, cool. There, there were re- reservations for the next day for the team that won. So God, That's super cool, actually. It, yeah, it, it was awesome. It was even more awesome because we knocked Martin Yuza's team out of uh, top four contention <laughs> when, 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 when we were already locked. But <laughs> Just well, dream crushed him? Well, only one team got the Kobe beef, and they were one of the better teams. Oh, yeah. You, you did what you had to do for the beef. Yeah. Exactly. So the second story I actually wrote about an article recently, but it's just too good not to to, to reiterate it. Uh, and that this happened at U.S. Nationals in 2010. And so one player is playing Jund, and was kind of mana screwed, stuck on three lands after mulliganing. Actually, mulligan I think to five. And their opponent was playing a you know red blue like howling mind deck with a bunch of spells in it. And the Jund player had two obstinate Bailoths in hand. And decided, <laughs> you know what? I need to get these out, but I can't cast them. I only have three minutes. I'm going to cast Mind Rod on myself. Yeah. <laughs> Target player discards two cards. Well, that doesn't work. When you Mind Rot yourself and you discard Option to off, it just goes to your graveyard. Yeah. It's not a combo. It's not a Madness card. Your opponent has to do it. Yeah, it says specifically on it. <laughs> yes, if a spell or ability controlled by your opponent. Right. So, But here, the opponent's thinking, and put yourself in the opponent's shoes. Right. My opponent just cast Mind Rot. They targeted themselves. They have four cards in hand. The opponent thinks, 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 like, how can this make sense? What, What is happening? And they came to a conclusion, which I actually think was very reasonable, which was that the Jund player had two Venge Vines in hand, mm. was going to discard both Venge Vines. The next turn was going to play like a Bloodbraid Elf and get back both Venge Vines. So Vengevine, of course, is a 4-3 that if you play two creatures, it comes comes into play from the graveyard and has haste. Yeah. So, so the the red-blue opponent decides, you know, I have a way to foil this plan. I'm going to cast Twin Cast, copy target spell, <laughs> copy the Mind Rot, <laughs> make the opponent discard their entire hand, and then they won't be able to get back the Vengevines. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so then he, he ends up getting the Veiloths for free anyway. So he cast Twin Cast. The person with the, the Bailoth is like, well, I guess I'll discard these two Bailoths to you. <laughs> my they both go into play and then, you know, victory was had. <laughs> yeah. You know what the best part about that is we know who that was. I know both people. <laughs> yeah. I actually don't know who was on the, the – the, ultimately the bad end of it. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I don't know. I, maybe I know the – who was who was on the bad end of that? That was uh, E. McKenzie. Uh, uh, somebody I don't know. N- Nashville native. No, he, he, he's an awesome dude. Yeah, but the other was Rusty Kubis. <laughs> <laughs> yep. He he actually works on coverage. Um, you, you'll sometimes see him in the feature match area at Grand Prix. He was one of the people that uh, helped Rashad start GG's Live, Rashad's company, uh, back when – before streaming was really a thing for Magic and Rashad was streaming you know, local events and, and PTQs eventually. He ended up 
uh, you know, getting synced up with Star City and then eventually Wizards of the Coast. And and now, you know, Rashad's still still doing that stuff. But but Rusty was one of he's from Chicago also and a, a friend of Rashad's and was one of the people that really helped him get that off the ground. And uh, I remember the first time I, I heard that story and I couldn't believe it. And I had no idea that it was Rusty. And then Rusty told the story at dinner once. And I'm like, hold on a second. That was you? He's like, yeah. And it's like it's if you've ever met Rusty or ever get a chance to meet Rusty, it fits perfectly. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just the most thing, the most rusty thing possible to happen to somebody is he just punts in like the worst possible way and it comes out fantastic for him. <laughs> yeah, absurd. So it, it's pretty hard to top those stories, but the the last story here that I've got tonight is actually so absurd because of just the it was it was one of the few times when kind of the physical logistics of matches led to the situation. So this is at Nationals 2007. Me, Paul Chion, and David Ochoa played this Court of Calling, Arcanus, uh, Vesuvian Shapeshifter, this 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 kind of weird blue green constructed deck. Okay. And Gabe Walls and Jerry Thompson were both playing the same deck as well. They were both playing this blue green white Mystic Snake Blink deck, where the it had a bunch of creatures with come into play abilities, and uh, the the card Momentary Blink, which is a one and a white, which exiles a creature that immediately brings it back, and you can flash it back for three and a blue. So their like main combo was to play Mystic Snake, counter a spell, blink it, flashback blink, just lock your opponent out. Okay. So. We've got Gabe Walls, who's playing against uh, Paul Chion, and we've got David Ochoa playing against uh, Jerry T. And they're next to each other, and both players... So we've got two 75-card mirror matches. And both players are sitting next to each other where, you know, Webb and Paul are sitting next to each other, and Gabe and Jerry are sitting next to each other. So, actually, sorry, it was Jerry against Paul and Gabe against Webb. But, okay. So what happens is they play their match... And both game ones finish at about the same time. And now Jerry built the deck. Gabe doesn't really know how to sideboard. So as Jerry's sideboarding, Gabe's just watching Jerry's sideboard. Like, what? Oh, I see. Oh he's, just, he's just sitting next to him. And it's perfectly illegal to do that. Yeah. <laughs> You're allowed weird. to look at the matches next to you. So they're, they're sitting they're sitting there sideboarding. Gabe doesn't really know how to sideboard, so he watches Jerry's sideboard. The funniest part, though, is when Webb's still sideboarding. He's shuffling his deck. And next to him, Jerry suspends Ancestral Visions. Oh, no. And so Webb immediately takes his back deck back and goes and sides <laughs> in Rift Sweeper, which poses suspend cards. No way. <laughs> yeah. Since Jerry's match started a little sooner, Webb's just like, huh, I guess I should probably side in differently. Oh, and that's insane. <laughs> so you've got two exact mirrors going on. And, and – players in both matches are kind of looking at the other match. Actually, what the, the funny part is I think Paul and Jerry are basically unaware of this. They they, they had no idea this oh, was okay. going on. Where Webb and Gabe were just kind of kind of mising. They're just kind of like looking at the other match to figure out what they should be doing. <laughs> That's that is I have never seen that. That that like even if just two of the seats were flipped, that wouldn't work, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. It has to be perfectly exactly like that. And you need to have all the same cards. Like if it was like the same archetype but a little bit of a different build, a lot of that goes out the window too. Uh that's insane. Yeah, the the whole thing was just absurd and it was Again, it was just because they were seated next to each other in, in this manner, and that was just kind of how it was. And <laughs> you've got a sideboarding primer, and Webb got to <laughs> adjust his sideboard plan after seeing what Jerry did. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. But to hear him tell it, he kind of like had the deck on the table, but Gabe was still shuffling. And as soon as Jerry suspended Ancestral, Webb just kind of reaches forward and pulls <laughs> the deck back. <laughs> uh, that's great. So – the, the, those the, that'll be our, our story time for today. And I, this won't be every sign off, but uh, you know, every every couple sign offs, I'll probably, I'll probably bring out bust out some stories since I, I've started compiling them all in a document because I've, I've got a lot of them. And that will do it for tonight. <laughs>